Hello, hello. We are almost over time and welcome to the 79th edition of Airhex TV. What I recognize right now in the pre-announcement logo, I'm announcing the show at 6 p.m. CET. It is actually 8 p.m. CET, so I will have to change the logo, graphics or announcement, however we call it. So uh, the show is loaded, so let's uh, start with the questions. And um, before we start with the questions, I would like to uh, say hello to all the members or um, attendees from the uh, Meetup Airhex group. So they are getting more and more. So right now we are expecting 27 attendees from um, Meetup. So welcome all. And I will keep announcing the show there. Um, yeah, um, because you can subscribe to the calendar and now you don't have to remember now when the show happens. So, okay, now we have it. Then... Um, I get approached by from an author. It is a um, uh, friend of the show, and um, and he asked me uh, or about my opinion about this book, and I had no time to read it. But this book seems to be uh, really uh, reasonable price. So seven euros is almost nothing, I would say. And um, and he get this book got a bad review, which I don't understand at all. Uh, and it says this book is incomplete. So whatever it means. So. Um, I also wrote a book and I also published it on a Kindle and what can happen, you know, that the formatting goes wrong or whatever. They are, uh, it's like black magic, the Kindle publishing. But uh, so it doesn't seem to be fair. So, but um, I just took a look at the agenda and for me, it looks interesting. So uh, check it out at Amazon. So they wrote um, about, so um, Vadin, I already took a look at that. So they have uh, Jakarta e platform, a little bit of history, and uh, they no sequel, which is a fresh take, and uh, Jakarta no sequel, and J Moore Moore DB. So uh, uh, then uh, Eclipse Micro Profile a little bit, Java Server Faces, and then uh, Vadin. So uh, it just seems like a really interesting book, not just you know all the Java e or Jakarta e specs, rather than they try you know uh, you see Eclipse uh, JSON Web Token. Um, a role-based access control and realms. I, so I, I didn't learn, uh, I didn't had time to read it. But uh, if you like, read it and uh, give me a feedback uh, the next month. So I, I, just, I expect to be an interesting read. So thank you for, for that. And now to the questions. Now, the very first question is, this is feedback from the uh, Jaretto review I did last month. And uh, what I said, okay, what I don't like is that the um, that the exceptions are serialized. And he said, okay, the exceptions are serialized to JSON, which means that they can be are also easily consumable by non-Java clients. So what happens here? The exceptions are serialized as a payload body JSON. I tend not to do this. So what I usually do, I try to also think about a nice um, HTTP status code and put the information in headers. But if you have to do it i mean then you have it right so there's um just do it <laughs> then um the next question is they, uh, they use json instead of http headers for exceptions because it allows us to transport structured data if necessary so uh, it means like the uh, errors can be rather complex and they would like to transport the data to the client this really depends you know on the client sometimes it is absolutely forbidden to reveal any additional information to the clients so this happens once in my projects so we even have to shut down the headers because of security so it really depends on the requirements but i also understand that and if, if this is your requirement so just do it so this is but this is more than Jaretta would be a specific solution for a specific client and not a general purpose solution to uh, or interesting for you know the majority of Jakarta or micro profile projects and um, also nice explanation because what I said why you don't using why you uh, using thread local not request scoped um, and the answer is because they also use this for uh, standalone applications for Java clients so my feedback is now what you could use is standalone CDI and uh, it, uh, it is to bootstrap is like two lines of code. So before I would use thread local, I would rather uh, bootstrap the CDI container would actually did already in some JavaFX project and Swing projects back then. So this should work. So um, just think about what you could do on the client side. You could um, start, you know, the, uh, instead of thread local, just start the uh, Java SE CDI container and uh, then you could get rid of the thread local and the dependency injection would work as, as expected. 
Now, uh, thank you, Angie. The next one is Mr. Sivitz, and he approached me via email, and he approached me via email and said, hey, look, you know what happens now, right? So no questions answered via email. So I forward him to AHEX TV, and it took a week, but he then um, um, wrote me an, um, a nice uh, question or and uh, a little bit of background information, and I only would like to have to look it up. And the um, the there is a podcast, and the podcast was about uh, micro profile web web client. So I can actually uh, try to find that. And this is uh, micro. There will be lots of micro profile, but it was uh, exactly micro profile for zero features and ideas. And we had a chat with Emily Jung. And uh, what uh, what I uh, said is that in at my Java 6 uh, time or Java 7, I wrote an application in the Night Hex book, and uh, I got an idea which worked actually really well. Uh, and this is the following idea: If you think about microprofile config, there is a collection or set of all configuration you have. Now, if you inject from a few things from your hash map, which is kind of a hash map, micro profile config or a, a tree almost, but usually a hash map to, to your application and uh, something is uh, left over, then you know not everything was injected. And uh, what I did with that, I just listed the properties because then I said, okay, why there is more configuration actually given or deployed or shipped then I'm actually using this should be an error. Uh, I should either you know delete the configuration or use it. This this was the origin idea. What Mr. Sivitz did uh, is even more interesting, but it's not the solution to my problem. Did something different. I took a look at that, and uh, it looks actually nice. So let's see. Now um, the Mr. Sivitz said, okay, he wrote a framework Vipers. Okay, be before I will you know evaluate the code, I just fire it up and see how it works. So now. Here is the Viper. So this is my uh, POC, which I created with my uh, Jakarta e archetype. And the Viper is the entire framework. So, okay, I'm, I would, I'm interested, actually, um, how it is impl implemented. And I have to say, it is actually really well implemented. So it is pragmatic. And there is a suite of CDI tests, which I took a look at. And um, there is a CDI tests. There is a, a generator, which I said, okay, I, I really don't like generators. If I saw already generators, okay. Uh, I mean, deleted. Uh, we are not Angular, right? <laughs> but um, so I took a look at that, and um, and what I have to say, it is probably the most pragmatic generator implementation I ever saw. It uses configuration key processor and a, a, a bunch of velocity um, templates. So um, I would say, okay, this is understandable. I mean, understandable. You, if if something breaks, I could, I think I could fix that. And uh, so for me, very pragmatic, 300 lines of code, one class, okay, so okay, nice. And it ships even with tests, so which is not usual. And there are generator tests and there's the library. Okay, now, and it is really well documented. So the entire documentation is uh, longer than the generator, which is, or at least, uh, actually almost even. And um, so, and then I, I was curious how it actually works. And uh, what I did is I created my uh, Viper proof of concept with Jakarta archetype, so I already uh, showed you this on the show. And there is the um, POC with POM. Looks like that. So I used the version with the Viper, and I used the plugin, compiler plugin. And uh, what happens is it's quite interesting. So if I um, just take a look at the target here. So if I say Maven clean, so hopefully, oh, of course not here. Uh, Viper POC and in Viper POC. This is here. Maven clean. And let's see what happens. And now, of course, everything disappeared. Maven package. And now it will generate a class. Hopefully. And this class here, Maven Viper generated sources. Uh, actually, two classes have been generated, which is nice and clean. And the configuration which is also nice and clean. So the question is why something is generated here. Just for convenience, I actually misunderstood the configuration and I wrote a class by myself and it was not a problem at all. But um, 
And uh, what you have to do is the following. So I, I created a more evolved example, and now you see actually the uh, the added value. What you can do with it, you can say add inject airhex key configuration, and the airhex key configuration is this what was generated, and it's generated from airhex keys. So what I can do right now is I can say there is an enum, and an enum specifies, you know, let's say, 10 different enum names or how to call it keys so and uh, the uh, framework or framework the one class library so uh, this um, framework framelet <laughs> this framelet uh, let me inject the message um, and uh, now it is will always work hopefully because it is type safe and uh, yeah and i can just use it so i just tried that with white slide and it worked immediately um, Exactly. So I actually, if you don't believe me, start Whitefly and just you will see it is going to be hopefully deployed. Where is it? Nowhere. Then let's try to deploy it. Uh, it was uh, Viper Park, Viper Park, and then uh, just do a what deployment. And is deployed, and let's come back here, and you see it deploys uh, the Viper POC, and now I can just create another terminal and say curl localhost 8080 Viper POC resources and pink. This is a Whitefly Java Jakarta project and pink, and I get calculated value message. Why calculated uh, uh, value? Because I said, okay, I wanted to implement my own uh, Airhex configuration resolver, which implements configuration resolver from the Viper framelet. <laughs> and uh, then I just said, okay, uh, this is dynamic value. But I could read it, you know, from microprofile config or whatever. I would say an interesting project um, and very pragmatic one, well written, is on GitHub, well documented. Maybe you can, you, you need that. And there are lots of configuration-related questions today, so probably there could be some joint forces. And uh, on GitHub, uh, by the way, uh, we have to look at that. It is really nicely done. So, and what I did is I tried this uh, variant, and then and they say, uh, then annotate the enum. What I did, and then he says, you know. Uh, it will create my configuration, and I just wrote the configuration by myself, and I wonder myself why I have two classes, right? So uh, just read the documentation. But nice framework. Thank you, Sivitz. Mr. Sivitz and um, Roberto Piva is his name, not Sivitz. And um, yeah, so, and Roberto said, okay, uh, I'm a junior developer. It doesn't like a junior. I would say it looks like a pragmatic senior. So um, thank you for your nice framework and probably emily looks you know the show uh it looks <laughs> watches the show and uh maybe she can you just you know to spark some ideas in the micro profile now robert N uh, nistroy he's uh, also um, a friend of the show so i read his name several times and he asked me something interesting um he asked me you know would you recommend Quarkus for building monolith? And my answer is uh, absolutely. So I always start with the monolith and I uh, always use uh, frequently Quarkus these days. And um, and uh, yeah, and um, this is way to go. I mean, I mean, why not? What happens if you use, you know, Quarkus for monolith? So it will, uh, you will save I would say 40% of memory uh, if you run on the same JVM as your monolith on other application server. And I don't think there are any downsides. Of course, you know, the, the first uh, half an hour is a little bit less productive because you have, you know, set up all the dependencies up front. But uh, I mean, you add whatever you can, right? And then you can still remove it later. But um, yeah. But, um, and by the way, I always start with monolith. I never start with microservices just for fun. So I try now to spend uh, uh, sufficient time with on one monolith code base to understand the business logic and then either I split it to microservices or not. So Robert, go for it. And uh, building monolith is actually a good thing. We are not a no distributed computing research project. Okay, now, ah. Uh, this is another nice guy. He also writes, uh, writes uh, a book about Jakarta. 
And uh, also he approached me at per email and said, okay, look, please, you know, your question is way too interesting, so ask here. And uh, he, uh, he asked me whether he's allowed to use a know what. Of course, just use it. And he said, okay, to detect the change in the Docker image, what I think, what you mean is, would you like to, you know, you would like to detect the change not in the Docker image rather than the change in the source image and then build the Docker image. I think this is what you need. Um, exactly. And rebuild automatically like the source, yeah. And um, so... I uh, I won't do this, but uh, what I think I will have to do it one day, uh, but because I got many requests, is that the what will scan your source file changes and is able to invoke then whatever you like, so a shell script or whatever, so you can misuse what as a watcher, basically. And uh, this is actually one of my to-dos, and uh, then you can, you know, uh, just uh, uh, tell what to invoke your script, and the script will invoke Docker, if you like, or command. Now, why I still don't use it? Because there are two projects. One is Scaffold from, uh, from uh, Google, which is similar to this, what you need. It goes a little bit further, but it already, already, it already watches the changes and uh, builds the image. And uh, there is also an interesting project called, uh, called JIP. And actually using this uh, JIP plug Maven plugin right now, to deploy, uh, to create uh, Docker images, um, we, we, you can do it um, just without even having Docker installed. So with these two plugins, you get something similar to what? Okay, nice. Next question. So Ali, of course. By the way, my name is Ali. Then comes BTTB. So Ali BTTB. You know. And uh, I don't know whether I should pronounce the dots as well. So B dot T dot uh, T dot B. So don't be offended, you know, B T D B. But Ali is nice. B T D B, I would say, uh, is too cryptic, but uh, no, what I can do. Now, the question is how to make the thin war as portable as possible regarding database access. First, data says definition. This is actually uh, simple. Oh, again, uh, accept all cookies. And there is an old, almost forgotten, forgotten annotation called data source definition. If you just, you know, uh, use the annotation, it will automatically create data source on the fly. So uh, problem solved. The next one is a little bit harder. And uh, the next one is JDBC connectors deployable to Whitefly, but needs some other config in Pyra Glassfish. I don't. Uh, what do you mean by JDBC connector? I think JDBC data source, Ali. This is what you need. And um, in true, uh, other way around. I mean, it's trivial in Payara. You just copy a jar to Payara, and it works. And it's quite, you know, a challenge in 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 uh, Whitefly. And you can see this is my old blog post, and it has seventy thousand wow views. Incredible. So one of the most popular. Uh, <laughs> blog post which actually which actually describes how to install a data source in um, in uh, on whitefly and arun gupta was uh, at uh, red hat and he was the, like the whitefly um, how to call it ambassador or devrel chief or something like this and i wrote in an email what you have to do is to figure out you know to easier install jdbc drivers and he said yes, but never managed to do that. And then probably because of that, he la left uh, Red Hat and then, you know, spent now some nice time in AWS. I think this was the, the reason. <laughs> okay, just kidding, right? Um, this was 100% not the reason, but uh, funny to think about. Okay, so um, the problem is with uh, Whitefly. Whitefly, you will need a script to create a JDBC on the fly or in cloud, almost cloud native environment. Uh, what I tend to do is, um, there's my Docklands project, and if you go to Whitefly, so Docklands, this is Adam Bean Docklands, and this is a collection of of uh, Docker files, and uh, which I use as a starting point for actually all my projects. And um, so, for instance, what we have is Whitefly, and this is the super Docker file, Whitefly. 
So th it comes without any white flag configuration. So what I did uh, in my latest course, uh, white flag, for instance, three months ago, as you can see for my apps with micro profile workshops, uh, this is not that, apps with micro profile workshop, is the following. Uh, I just inherited from the configuration and added, you know, the standalone configuration which uh, contains Jäger tracing uh, enhancements. Um, so you could do the same. So you can have a base Whitefly image and then one image with uh, already uh, containing Postgres or whatever drivers you need. And then you will inherit from this Docker image and then you are set. So there is nothing else to do. And this is what uh, where you get uh, portable behaviors between application servers. So you could create like a base image with all your proper appropriate, yeah, proprietary JDBC drivers because Postgres, Oracle or whatever is always proprietary. It's not a part of the standard. And then all the servers are the same. And then you only have, you know, to use the data source config, uh, data, say, data, data source definition annotation and then you are set. Okay. Podcasts done. What else was the podcast? The last one was about... Oh, the last one is actually interesting because I got um, uh, lots of questions regarding reactive programming. And uh, we covered with Clement, this uh, French guy, <laughs> a, um, a lots of ground regarding OSGI. He was a deep in the with OSGI. Then, you know, uh, what are the killer features of OSGI? And we spent some time, you know, discussing... Uh, reactive programming and Clement is actually one of the main guys from Vertex and now Mutiny and Quarkus. So, um, and uh, yeah, we, we had uh, uh, some arguments about reactive programming. So if you like, uh, listen to it. Okay, next one. So uh, what do you do in cases when you have to include some built ready information, build number, build date into an application? Uh, in war, with war, Pretty simple. Uh, pretty simple. Uh, what I what I tend to use is to, uh, it created a JAXRES re resource, a version resource, which uh, which uses class loader to x to uh, to what? Let let's see. Uh, are there actually questions? Okay. Ali said uh, on what I deploy the GDBC driver the same way I deploy the application war. Okay, cool. So I can do this. And this, what you saw is uh, you could just uh, create a super Docker image. And in Payara, you would just copy the JDBC driver into Glassfish lib folder on the top level. Okay. Um, okay, you have another interesting point with the phone gap, which, um, yeah. Um, okay, well, um, back to the podcast. So, and uh, Clement. M uh, mentioned phone gap here and it's like okay phone gap was a nice framework and i clicked on phone gap and you will see that this was discontinued and they and and august august the first and there is the uh, this description here and what they wrote is that on october 1st the entire build server will stop working which is interesting because we got also questions regarding no phone gap back uh, the show. What's my opinion about phone gap on Cordova? And uh, what's interesting, it's after five years, it stopped working. So, uh, so this is what I always mean. I think that in the front end, you know, frameworks becomes become less relevant over time, and web standards are actually the future. Because uh, if a framework, you know, stops in one point of time, we have a problem. Okay, so this was the phone gap story. So next one. Yeah, and uh, what I do with, uh, exactly, and I wanted to go to the terminal, just make it larger, and for instance, take a look. If you take a look on Viper, Viper POC. And we build the Viper POC, and then we go to target. And here, CD Viper POC, meta inf. It's not there. But it is inside the war uh, jar. Uh, Viper war. 
So as you can see, there's a meta in uh, manifest MF. And here is some build information, like, you know, the version build and so forth. And you can access that actually using a class loader, like uh, this class get resources stream and so forth. And then you have the MF, and then you convert it in JSON, and you have your build, in build information. This is what I tend to do. Okay. Nice. Uh, next one. Uh, exactly. Uh, how do you implement custom Bulma CSS? So Bulma... So there is a nice or nice uh, framework called Bulma, Bulma, and this is not a nice CSS framework. It's like competitor to Foundation or uh, Twitter Bootstrap. Why it is nice? Because uh, it is mainly CSS, or actually, it is just as CSS without any JavaScript. And if you like to know to have style button, you can say uh, button class button, and uh, it already looks reasonable. The only thing what I don't like is it ships with uh with um media queries so and i like to, to define media queries by myself so it, it little it looks a little bit um strange in the um responsive design debugger uh in and developer tools but uh i use it it's nice and i also use that in the apps with web component workshop so i use bulma to style that so uh, probably if you if you would like to see more just look at that and there is uh, the uh, on GitHub. There is the repository with the source code. If you like to find how it works, of course, completely free. But now the question is, you know, uh, how to how to use it. So, and how do I implement custom Bulma CSS styles in every web component in my app? Not a problem at all because if you don't use Shadow DOM. Inheritance is working, so you can just inherit. You know, you can just specify everything at the top level, and then everything would be like pushed down. And a web component usually wraps native DOM elements like buttons, text fields. This is what you would like to style. And if you would like to style your components, you can do it at the top level, and you just refer to your elements and use Bulma styles. Um, this is what I think we're asking. And if you're using Shadow DOM, so this the delegation won't work anymore, but you can still load the style per component. So you can load, you know, your Bulma styles directly into the Shadow DOM. I wouldn't start with Shadow DOM at the beginning, and it really depends what you are doing. If you're building, you know, like uh, a design system with uh, just the components, I would use Shadow DOM and load it individually. Usually in more enterprise-like projects where we have, you know, Larger views, um, we use the Shadow DOM and an and upper level. So it's not like every component ships with Shadow DOM. Shadow DOM is used more or less at the top level. So that's the difference. So um, this is what you have to do is, but um, what you usually n n should not do is like, you know, inherit from button uh, it, it, uh, and, and create your own, you know, my button component. What you, what I would expect that you are doing is you create, you know, um, like say air hex button component which contains a button you can just style it with bulma now um now someone with the uh, very simple name vari kapil 13 asked me we recently switched to jwt with microprofile Payara, everything worked work well then they switched to websockets and it stopped working or there is no solution for websockets and uh, funny enough uh, i had similar problem but a complete different uh, uh story i use actually Payara. And there was no problem, you know, to pass the tokens back and forth. We have another problem. Uh, everyone, not, not we, everyone has the problem. Um, if you take a look at, first we can cl close the Bulma. And the WebSocket specification, and this is the browser implementation, there's actually no way to pass the token to the backend. So what we had to do is we, we were forced to use JAXRS for the JSON Web Token authentication. authentication and then the server pushed the JSON web token via WebSocket and we could uh, just read it, for instance, right? So there is uh, actually no way in browser to, 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 to send the JSON web token to the server. What you could do, the, uh, you could provide this as query parameter. This would work, the token. Okay, now the question, you know, uh, what you could do in the backend. So uh, there is a, uh, oh, again... There is a um, WebSocket configurator before request and you get the headers here. So you could actually receive the headers and WebSocket without the filter. So you could actually do it. Because, But again, 
there was no obvious solution for us, you know, to pass the JSON web token from uh, by opening the WebSocket from the from, from the browser. This was the problem. But on the server, you could use the before request configuration, and it actually should work. Okay, so this was, uh, and uh, the next problem is if you take a look at the support for custom headers for Handshake, um, you will see that this is actually a known issue in all browsers and uh, none of the browsers tries to support it, Also, it is actually um, specified in the spec, it is not implemented in the browsers. So now the web standards are nice, but sometimes not fully supported by browsers. But uh, fr frameworks also cannot help you, except they, they will use a uh, side communication, side channel communication, like use you know, uh, fetch to pass the token to the server and then pre-authenticate you or something like that. Okay, and uh, yeah, and this is uh, what you should know is the web sockets in Jakarta e is a two-step process. First, uh, this is actually the same security and the same and the same uh, context as uh, JaxOS. So if you authenticate yourself via JaxOS, you should be also authenticated via WebSocket. So it should work out of the box because there are two-step process. First is HTTP and then the request gets upgraded. And this is described here. Okay, so uh, this is the, uh, you know, ten. this is the last official question. And then I got, you know, some uh, more questions in the recent two hours. So uh, Florian asked me how to update an injection point. So what he means by that is that he would like to have everything refreshed. And uh, one solution would be to inject your configuration as an object, and this object knows how to, uh, um, how to, or this object is hot refreshable. So um, I actually did it in my real world Nighthacks book from 2009, I think. All my configuration was hot refreshable, but I use it probably once a year. So the true you know, cloud native approach would be that you, you know, change the deployment configuration, the pod gets restarted. So this is the most uh, robust way to change that. The uh, hot refresh part, you know, is the question if you have two nodes running in a cluster, uh, you would need something like, you know, atomic broadcast, you know, to notify all, now, you know, change the configuration. Otherwise, it may be that, you know, the one node gets the, com uh, the configuration earlier than the other one. But with instance inject injected get, um, this is also a solution that you use the instance, and then on every call, the uh, configuration gets refreshed. So I would go either with this or cache it completely, and there's also middle ground. If you use request scoped, then the configuration gets rejected in every call. So the easiest possible solution would be for everything which has to be hot refreshable, use you know at uh, request scoped at inject config property, and then it gets you know re uh, re injected every time. And if you need to you know some hot refresh functionality, you can implement your own config source which is hot refreshable. This will be probably the cleanest solution and less magical one. And, but this works as well. So I did it in Jakarta e projects. Um, so, uh, but there is visible. Is there a visible penalty? It really depends what you're doing, you know, behind the scenes. And there is a visible penalty because uh, this is the penalty which was, you know, the performance difference between EGBs and CDI was roughly 20% back then, and EGBs were faster than CDI. And uh, yeah, this is the penalty. But uh, it was faster, but it was pointless if you hit, hit the database once. So it was, yeah. Now, now Aldo Lushka, uh, no, Aldo Lushkia, ask, oh, let's again. Aldo, oh man, so if I have a, after, after seven years, not always. Ovari Kapil as from Passau, this is a nice city, almost in Bavarian forest in Germany. A three river city, Vari Kapil. Okay, Vari is uh, Florin. Okay, on and this from Milano, Aldo Lushka. The first time since seven years I used the feature from you know from, from GitHub to identify the attendees. So, very simple. So, um, Aldo, so he you ask me, this is a very similar question, and So actually, this is exactly the same question as before. So uh, he's, uh, he says a database table, and he would like to re-inject, you know, whatever's in the database table um, to restart the databases. This is exactly what... So if you need 
so I will try to read that. This is a fresh, you know, two hours ago. Um, Often, always in our projects, happen to have configuration, URL for database connections, of course, in a table configuration, okay, within databases, relation databases, configuration that are typically encapsulated within bin singleton, okay, because you, will, you have, yeah, okay, this is reasonable, you have singleton bin, could be application scoped, and loaded when the application starts with call to database and color mapping, so it would be startup singleton. Then, often, the, the need arises also to do hot refresh, it's exactly the same question as before, and, um, of such configuration case, one of those flex changes, so the idea was to expose a dedicated service only for the refresh in the singleton bin. Uh, yeah, actually, you should talk to the Viper guy because it already manages the entire injection, so you, he could actually very easily inject his framework. This was my, by the way, I already solved all your questions because this is the answer to your question. So get configuration value, I can hold reload whatever I like. If I use Viper, I'm done without Viper as the instance. Next one. Considering the scenario question one, it's mainly due to deploy environment with Tomcat migrating such application to Wildfly. I was thinking of using Micropro specification. Yes, if you're migrating from Tomcat to Wildfly or Quarkus, uh, if you have the chance, before I would migrate to Wildfly, we use Quarkus. Why? Because if I have to migrate, I mean, Quarkus is newer than migrated to Quarkus. But Wildfly is also perfect. As, as I saw, um, I created a proof of concept with, uh, with uh, Wildfly. But because it was a little bit faster, so I just created, fired up my Jakarta archetype and then fired up what and it worked. So, and he says some data would be within the source code. Um, I mean, it really depends. So the data in the source code, this is true. So how this would work with microprofile config, you have property file in Java, and this would be the defaults. And uh, you could override the defaults. This is um, with Docker or Kubernetes settings. This is the idea. So if this is security, um, okay, if this has to be encrypted uh, and you're running on Kubernetes, use secrets. Um, or uh, HashiCorp Vault. This is the name of the project, Vault from V-A-U-L-T, Vault from HashiCorp. Okay, now DHPI, and this is very easy to look up. Hans, ha, huh. Hans, uh, how can I unit test a JNDI lookup that I do in Payara? Um, JNDI lookup, I mean, why this is not a unit test rather than integration test? And if you know, if you have the reference, it passes. So this is a typical case of system tests. For unit tests, you are you are, you would encapsulate the JNDI lookup in a service locator and then mock out the entire service loca locator, regardless how, you know, the resource is fetched. So, uh, Xworker, and I can look it up easily. Oh, not this time. Xworker. Um, in your latest uh, web dev video, this was the, um, I already closed the browser. This is um, web components with Redux and LitHTML. Um, I was putting the entire uh, Redux state into local storage. What would be the approach if you want to parts of the Redux store in local storage and other parts into session storage? Ah, into session storage. Okay, what I did is, because in this course I said, okay, I don't care about the servers, um, and I put the entire state in Redux, and I was able to put it in the local storage, which would make sense. I actually still use the app uh, if I have to know to announce some events. And uh, he asked me, no, if you would like to parts in local storage in other parts parts into the session storage. Not that different to sending the data to the server. So um, what I did, what usually I'm doing with a Redux and, and, and you have, uh, I call it controls, exactly the architecture as the backend boundary control entity. And these controls are communicating to, with the server first, get fetching the data and then storing the data into the uh, local storage in my case. What you could do is you could fetch the data from session store and put it into local store. So instead, forget the server and replace the server with session storage and then you have the solution uh, two different top level object and filtering no i would still use uh, uh, one store but um, if they are really really complete different you know um, domains which was never the case in my projects you could also have two redux stores not nothing prevent you of doing that and uh, i'm really glad you like the courses christian oh you see 
So this is anonymous, but this is nice as Christian. So uh, as you can see, now I'm the master of streaming. Yeah, as you can see, now I know everything. So Mr. Franden, and this is of course Dennis Frank from Germany. Uh, which annotation do you usually use in your Quarkus projects to ensure that BIN is discovered by CDI container? Uh, dependent request scoped. Um, so dependent, yes. And uh, in my projects, I tend to use my own stereotype called control, which is actually dependent. Uh, why that? Because um, um, I had already in um, I've worked with some of my startups, for instance, really like you know uh, the control and boundary, and they named everything control and boundary and don't like the names so i would like to call the classes after their responsibilities and not after you know some layering so um in this particular case i use at control annotation put it on the class and this annotation is already dependent and if you need to you know later i don't know uh, some monitoring you can also put annotations on it which jvm do you use in your project to run application servers or which is more stable according to your experience open jdk uh, build of a specific vendor hotspot open g9 so i'm using whatever my clients are using so this is important thing i ask my clients okay with which uh, with which you know uh, company do you have a uh, and contract commercial support if they have nothing then i would say on red hat i always use red hat uh, on uh, and uh, on on um, and most stable i would say probably right now still Oracle, and the reason is because uh, it's the oldest one. And uh, OpenG9 looks really good, so I use it um, uh, more and more. This is very fast. No idea how stable it is on uh, in production, but um, you have to understand that OpenG9 comes from IBM, and this was uh, implemented also for the host systems, so it's probably rock solid. And uh, I have some experience with Azul systems. It's very stable. And uh, I mean, the uh, Red Hat one is also, uh, I mean, White Flag is running on Red Hat, right? So, um, yeah. And uh, on my machine, I use um, OpenJDK, the Adopt uh, OpenJDK, or uh, Open OpenJ9. This is what I use locally. So, nice. Let's see whether there are some remaining questions. Uh, no questions here. Um, oh, uh, this is actually, I actually wanted to, to mention that. There is um, the drive-in conf, and let's see what a friend of the show. So I actually took part at the conference, and uh, the, the, the funny inter uh, the funny story was uh, I was approached by uh, Dimitri, and he said, "Okay, uh, whether it would be possible for me, you know, to pre-record the session." And I say, "Look, this is boring, not honest." I don't like it. And he said, okay, he understands, but uh, there could be, you know, some streaming issues. This is uh, this is drive-in conference, so they actually they, they go by cars there. And uh, we said, okay, look, then we we will invite a small group of people, airhex.com, uh, sorry, meetup, airhex.com, who are just limited to 15, and we will do a live session, and we will use the recording and stream it again there. And uh, this was actually the very first, you know, live pre-recording of a conference, and I think... The first conference, drive-in conference, where uh, you could, you know, use your car and watch um, actually some web components back then. And this is already on the on my YouTube channel if you're interested how it worked out. So um, thank you for watching. See you at upcoming conferences. Ehex Live. Oh, you see. So uh, again, workshops or just go with the Ehex Ehex Com. So and there is uh, there is going to be micro profile with Quarkus and uh, micro frontends with web components two workshops in December. There are already sufficient registrations that they will uh, take place for sure. By the way, uh, I have to say, in the last seven years it, there was never a workshop cancelled because of lack of attendees. So it means like you know Java E on micro profile and uh, there are still highly you know popular technologies. So um, they will take place and next year. They, they, they are going to be an, a live Airhex workshop in March about event streaming and event-driven architectures. So a little bit of Kafka and stuff like that. So on that note, thank you for watching and see you uh, next month with the 80th <laughs> Airhex TV. So thank you and bye.